Uh, my parents are both um, dead. Um, my father died four years ago. He left to be quite elderly. And my mother died many years ago when I was a child. <coughs> um, they basically are from this area, about 50 miles from here, the neighboring county. Um, in fact, my father's mother grew up in Richland Springs, right? the closest village to the monastery. At that time, there was no monastery, of course, back then. So uh, they uh, and their ancestors lived in this area going all the way back to the uh, 18th century, some of the first Europeans that lived in this area. And also, I have descended from Puritans settled in Massachusetts in the 1630s, and the Mayflower too, even earlier than that a little bit, and the Dutch that settled uh, what's now New York City and Albany, so they're all among my ancestors. And my father was a, a businessman and uh, different businesses, and my mother uh, was his helper, and, uh, also a housewife. They were uh, Protestants. Uh, all of my ancestors were Protestants back to the Reformation. And uh, I was raised basically in the Baptist Church, but also other Protestant denominations, whichever was closer. Uh, the last few years before I uh, went to college, we went, went to a Lutheran church. And then I became interested in the Catholic Church. When I started reading, which I love history, and I started reading history seriously you know, in the last couple of years of high school, and I started going to the Roman Catholic Church, which upset my parents very much. We were a family that went to church every Sunday. Religion was taken seriously, but I, as I got older, I felt something was missing. I felt that uh, when I became uh, exposed to like the Roman Catholic Church, the history, mm -hmm. um, and also certain things that the Protestants don't usually practice, like veneration of the saints, especially the Virgin Mary, which really much attracted me. And just, I think, the historical importance. I thought, well, how can, you know, all of a sudden, the 16th century, people are correcting Christianity. What happened for 1,500 years? <laughs> I didn't know anything about the Eastern Orthodox Church. I think I knew it existed, but I just thought it was sort of an Eastern kind of Catholicism, you know, and uh -huh. I really thought, oh, you know, the Pope, he's the head of the church, you know, and blah, blah. And uh, although when I started actually attending Catholic services, I felt very disappointed because it was exactly when they were instituting reforms of the Second Vatican Council. So a lot of things that really appealed to me were disappearing <laughs> in the Roman Catholic Church or certainly downplayed. And that really confused me. But then I went to South America for a year, which to a country where most of the people were Catholic. And... Uh, but I was distracted by a lot of other things. So, uh, But when I went to college, my first year, I met a girl who was of uh, Russian descent, and she was Orthodox. So I was very curious about it, and, and she felt she couldn't really explain very well to me the, how Orthodoxy was different. So she invited me to come here. I didn't even know this monastery existed. We were only about 45 minutes away, the college. So we came here, I came here with her a couple of times, and then I took a course in college in Russian culture, and the, the uh, professor was himself Orthodox, he was Bulgarian Orthodox, and he brought me a few times here, and it fascinated me. But uh, I didn't really do any deep studying or anything about it, and, and I kind of pushed it away, because I thought it didn't really have anything to do with me. You know, I'm American, you know, what... A, it's, you know, if I become Orthodox, it's going to be very difficult in <laughs> more way than one. And, uh, but then uh, my last couple of years at college, I started coming here with friends and talking to, each time I talked to a seminarian or, and then finally I, when I started working after college, um, I was still drawn here all the time. And, uh, Beginning in 1980, I started coming here more seriously to try to, to really find out whether this was for me or not. And, and I, that's when I met the future Bishop Luke. He was a young monk at that time, and uh, he uh, answered all my questions that I had that, you know, sort of tempted me against becoming Orthodox. 
So then I finally said, well, you know, just, just become Orthodox, you know, <laughs> because I really didn't belong to any church because growing up Baptist, the Baptist typically do not to baptize people until they're 12 or 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And by that time, my mother had died and I, we started going to the Lutheran church. So I started going to catechism classes in the Lutheran church and then I started going to the Catholic church. And, you know, and so, so I decided, well, you know, I'll just become Orthodox and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I started coming here often, more often. And then every weekend I was coming here. So uh, then I talked, and of course, again, to Father Luke, and also he introduced me to Father Hilarion, who's now the Metropolitan mm -hmm. uh, First Hierarch of our Church, and he was a higher monk at that time and spiritual father, so he baptized me and, and uh, blessed me to come here to seminary. Mm -hmm. So they kind of snuck me in while the bishop was gone, the future Metropolitan, Loris, um, and... Uh, I say snuck me here because if you asked Willy Kaloris, if you were American, he would say, well, go home and learn Russian. But that was his way of making sure people just didn't come here because they were, you know, and then leave. You know, he wanted to make sure people came here seriously. So they, that's why they snuck me in here when he was gone. <laughs> so he was going on a pilgrimage. And when he came back, here I was, you know, he was going to kick me out at that point, you know. So, um, so that's how I ended up here. But my parents, they, you know, when I, when they found out I was coming here, I would have to ask, uh, you know, for a car or something. I'd have my own car back then, and uh, they thought I was just, you know, part of my curiosity, wanting to learn about different cultures and everything, which I always was like that. But then I told them I was coming here to go to seminary. They, they, I'm sure they thought I'd gone mad. So. <laughs> Because they, you know, I had a lot of education, and they thought I would use that education, and but they weren't terribly upset because they they figured, oh, you know, he's young, he's just he's just experimenting, you know, different things, and he'll he'll come to his senses probably eventually. <laughs> well, I'm still here after 41 years, and uh, they they were never so. They weren't so concerned about me being here. What really bothered them was when my sister decided to become Orthodox 10 years later. They felt that, you know, that it was because she was um, under my influence. And uh, there certainly was an influence there, I'm, I'm sure, but um, they just interpreted it that way, and it was much more than that. But, but they were upset because she was a young single mother with a child, and so they thought she was like joining the cult because to my parents it was like a cult because if you're raised uh, typically American Protestants um, think of uh, it's almost like a civil religion it's all tied up with patriotism you know almost like orthodoxy is in Russia it's sort of like you know if you're Russian you're orthodox even if you don't believe in God something there's some cases of that you know so uh so they, you know, American Protestants just think, you know, literally this is one country under God, and and uh, there's uh, and so they just thought I was, you know, being sort of rebellious, and uh, I never, I never really tried. I tried to explain to them, but it was without any kind of success. Um, but of course, I wasn't sure. I that's why I went to seminary because. I, that way I thought, well, you know, at least I'll get some education and we'll see what happens. But after being here for about a year and a half, it was very clear to me that I should become a monk. Um, and uh, so uh, I, um, of course, talked to Father Luke about it, who also advised, was counseling me, my spiritual life. And he went to the bishop to ask him to make me a novice. And uh, um, so the day came when the, our custom here to become a novice, the bishop, who's also the abbot of the monastery, will just take you before the icon of St. Job and say a prayer, you know, and then give you the right to wear the scufia. And uh, so when the bishop, he came to me, he said, well, you know, so you want to become a bishop? Well, I was just flabbergasted by that question. So I said, well, not, not yet. <laughs> You know, not yet. I thought, oh, I said, what did I say? <laughs> not yet. 
he's going to think I'm really ambitious or something. But it just came out like that, you know, not yet. <laughs> anyway, he th probably confirmed him in my, in, but you know, he was nice. He made me a novice and, you know, so then I went through the different steps. Little, every couple of years, another step. <laughs>When I began to learn about the Royal Martyrs, um, it really impressed me. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. I think even most Americans are intrigued by the history of the Royal. They might not think of them as martyrs, the Royal family. It's such a poignant story how they lived. And, and of course, there's a lot of false information about them. Uh, you know, that the Tsar was sort of not very smart and just, you know, or the, and the empress was a hysterical woman. That's grossly exaggerated and it's certainly not the full story. Um, but they're, they're fascinated by it, by the royal writers. And, and uh, the, my parents took me before I went to South America to see the movie which had come out, Nicholas and Alexandra, which of course, looking back at that, it's not the best movie in the world from a historical viewpoint, but it did reveal at least you know, sort of the culture and something about the family. And of course, the way they died was just very moving, very tragic, of course. And uh, so very much intrigued me, especially, you know, the Empress was a convert to Orthodoxy and she took it very seriously. And, and, uh, and uh, so that just really attracted me. Um, I was very fortunate three years ago to be able to go to the 100th anniversary in Ekaterinburg of their uh, of their death, of their murder. And uh, so that was like a highlight for me to be there. Um, over 100,000 people at the service and to be at the actual place where they were, their bodies were deposited and you know, uh, so that was very, very special. So I, that's, I'd have to say that's a very special um, group of saints for me. As far as people, well, uh, Bishop Luke, um, he was one of the first ones to seriously talk to me and, uh, and guide me spiritually. And uh, to this day, you know, he's my spiritual father. And, uh, and, also, and also the old monks when I came here were very, all, very special. I'm very thankful that I came here when a lot of the older monks were still alive. They were from Russia or you know, and uh, had suffered, you know, uh, under communism and everything, and then came here and built this place, you know, and 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 uh, and they were very kind. They were very open to uh, non-Russians. You know, anybody who took orthodoxy seriously, they were very kind to. They, they of course, they were happy also that I tried to learn Russian and and uh, you know that I didn't try to say, well, I'm American. This is America. You know, you've got to, you have to change it. For me, for me, I wasn't like that at all, and uh, so uh, I remember all of them, you know. And, uh, and the last one just died, Father Job, you know, from the old monks that were here when I came here. So yeah, you know, you know, when I came here and I was trying to check everything out and figure everything out, you know, and and um, it seemed to me. You know, the, the old monks were very nice, but I thought they were, you know, very simple people, uh, which was all right, you know, and that they were they were very pious, of course, they worked very hard, and I knew they had had very hard lives, you know, living through, I actually knew monks who lived through the revolution when I came here, and then, of course, uh, the persecution in Russia, and, and then the World War II, and all of that involved, again, people being deported, and not having much food to eat and everything. And then and then a whole group came here. And Father Pantene was still around too when I came here. He was still alive. He was the founder of the monastery. And even though he didn't live through the revolution, he had a very hard life. I mean, he was very, came a very poor family, worked in a factory in America, and then he started this monastery. So, I mean, these those people were very uh, hardworking people and really strugg struggled. But then I came to find out that actually many of those people were very highly educated people. They weren't so simple. They were simple in spirit, you know, and men, they were very humble people, you know, true monastics. But they were, but they certainly weren't um, 
I mean, there was one monk, Father Archimandrite Serge, who acted very simple, and uh, he was out of the kitchen, and uh, when he spoke, he, he never spoke like an intellectual. He was always very simple. And I found out he came from a very intellectual family. His fa his brother is a psychiatrist in Chicago, and <laughs> you know. But he said, "Yeah, my brother doesn't much of a believer." I tried to tell him the real psychiatrists are the Holy Fathers, you know. <laughs> so I was very impressed by that. And then, and then of course the bishop too, uh, future Metropolitan Loris, who also was very humble, and you know he came from a very humble background. But he was self-learned. He learned in seminary and read a lot of books and everything. And he was um, a very wise person, and very spiritual. So I, I lived with these people. And uh, unfortunately, only after they died did I really appreciate them. <laughs> you know. But uh, Father Job, too, you know, he was the farmer monk. He worked in the barn. and uh, But then I found out, actually not long before he died, that his family in in Kharkov, in Ukraine, they were in the underground church, a lot of his ancestors and relatives, and they were secret nuns and monks and, you know, a lot of his family. Because I know in the church, in the altar, we have his list of people to pray for, and more than half of them are monastics. They're all his relatives. So he grew up in that, in that uh, you know, of what you might call Holy Russia. Now, the younger monks, I, like myself, I, even though I'm not one of the younger now already, I'm one of the older ones now, but uh, certainly compared to the older fathers, of course we're different. We, we're not the same, you know, and I think uh, that's plain to understand that we come from a more modern, complex background, secular background, uh, although I have to say there are differences too between American young monks and Russian young monks because the Russian, Russian young monks, well, not maybe the really younger ones, but the middle-aged ones, they came from, you know, still Soviet Union. So they grew up in an atheist society. Um, and uh, so that has its own baggage, you know. And, and then there's the younger monks who didn't even know communism, but they sort of, I think, you know, they've grown up, whereas the church is accessible, but it's still a very secular culture, you know, among people. The, and Americans is another story, and I'm, I'm different from other Americans because I grew up in a in the countryside where people are still more conservative, still more religious, um, in the, an American Protestant way, and uh, um, and I, I it used to be, I still is in large part. Um, that's one of the problems in this country now. There's a, there are big divisions between the more conservative people and the more liberal people. Uh, very big differences. Well, I come from the conservative people, so uh, I thank God for that too. I, I mean, though my parents, my relatives were Protestant, they were they were good people. They were religious. They believed in Christ um, in their way, and uh, and they took religion very seriously. So I grew up with that, and I think that was maybe a good base even for becoming Orthodox too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it wasn't their fault. They didn't know anything else. You know, there was. There was a time when I first was in Albany. I had already been here a number of times. And I thought, well, you know, I'll look at the other Orthodox churches. Like I said, there, was, there wasn't a lot of information available. Even in the, in the university library, which had like, I don't know how many million books, their section on Orthodoxy was like this big, you know. And it was really mostly books written by liberal Orthodox theologians. So that kind of confused me, you know, that there was such a difference. And and uh, um, so I thought, well, so I went to the Greek church in Albany. I went to the Antiochian church, and that was about it. And I, I felt they were very different from the monastery. Well, obviously, parishes are different from monasteries. But even that said, there were other differences, too. I just felt... Um, I, I probably mean it's monasticism, but also the spirituality I just felt was much thicker here. <laughs> there. And of course, the, those jurisdictions quite often have musical instruments in their church, they have pews, um, and that kind of turned me off. I thought that's not really orthodox, you know. And 
So yeah, I mean, I did look around a little bit, but um, I've never been in, I never belonged in any other jurisdiction. In fact, I've never been to a service in any other jurisdiction. I can't, no, no, I've not even the OCA. I've never been to a service in the OCA either. Um, so, and just in Russia, of course, basically we are the same church now, we're united and everything. Um, so, and that was a revelation because I have to point out that when I was uh, learning about orthodoxy, I also read, you know, some of the problems between the Russian Church Abroad and the Moscow Patriarchate. And, uh, you know, and some of the views are very, you might even say fanatical, you know, that that uh, the Moscow Patriarchate is not a real church, it's just a government, or, you know, that kind of thing. And I, and I that, uh, of course, I, I, I can't say that I really believed it, but it really influenced my thoughts. So my first trip to Russia in 2005, when we were already in the process of of um, of uh, coming to peace, I um, um, my bishop was wanted me to go to Russia to, so I could get a sense, a little bit of sense, even if it was only for a couple of weeks, of what was going on there. And so you know, I went to Moscow, went to the monasteries around Moscow and the and uh, in Moscow, and I saw that it's the same, basically, as it is here. Um, you know, I, obviously there's all kinds of people. There might be some people who might have liberal views or whatever, but we have people like that too. So, But I saw the services. I actually have to say, I even thought maybe the liturgy would be different, you know. But no, it's, it's just the same. <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, I was very edified. And then three years ago, of course, already was after the union and everything. I, um, I and, you know, I was... At the St. Sergius Monastery, that was very impressive. I went both times and went to services there, and and uh, so I, you know, I could see that this is a, there's a really no difference. Mm. No. In fact, the people I saw pray there, you know, the, and I got one interesting thing. I got involved in a little argument of two old women at the monastery at St. Sergius while I was waiting for a, my friends to arrange a tour for me, I heard these two women arguing behind me, two babushki, you know, and they were pointing the finger at each other and they were just going, ah. And I, I just looked and then all of a sudden they, they got me involved. And then they, they said, Batushka, you know, tell this old winch over here, this old hag, that she's a, she's a heretic. And I said, oh my God, I don't want to be involved. And the other one was saying, and you're full of pride, and you know. So what it came down to was they were arguing over whether it was possible for non-Orthodox people to be saved. And I thought, my goodness, you know, grandmas in the United States don't argue about such things. So I, I thought, now what am I going to say? You know, I have to be careful. But I, I said what I believe. I said, well, we can't tell who's going to be saved or not. Only God can do that. But, you know, the thing is, if we Orthodox were to leave the church, then of course there's no salvation. But what happens to people outside the church? I said the Holy Fathers say that's their conscience between them and God, you know, and they were very happy with that. And they they were like very like they looked at each other and said, "See, see." They both thought they were right then, and, and uh, so I thought, "Well, thank God I said the right thing." I think, yeah. What does it mean to be Orthodox? <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, well, I think it's the will of God that everyone should be Orthodox. It's uh, it's uh, the Orthodox Church is God's revelation to the world. It's 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 Jesus Christ incarnate. It's the Church is is Christ in the world, and uh, and so um, that to me is just doing what uh, what God's will is as and uh, I you know of course sometimes I wonder why me when not other people <laughs> but that's a mystery I uh, I was I was tonsured and blessed to be a monk and then later on I was ordained a priest so and uh, you know as a priest monk you combine the two 
First of all, you're a monk. You're, when a priest monk dies, he's buried as a monk. Uh, although you wear an epithelium and cuffs, but you have a monastic, at least usually, you have a monastic funeral. That's, that's how you can tell which is more important, perhaps. Um, or the priesthood is very important, of course. So that's my mission. But being in a monastery, it's an obedience. Um, naturally, I put myself into it, but I don't do anything major without a blessing from the abbot, you know, and I have his blessing. I, I was made a priest to do services here and to, to help out because we do daily services. So that's my mission and whatever else I'm told to do, like teach in seminary, you know, and uh, talk to people. <laughs> We're actually told to talk to people because uh, some people don't like to do that too much. But if they're made a priest monk, that's like one of the conditions is, you know, you have to... They won't ordain people unless they're going to be able to talk to people, you know. A priest monk is an obedience to his abbot. So basically his service is in the monastery to do services. And of course here we also confess people... We do panictitas, or what's called the trebi, you know, needs for people come here on pilgrimage, so we help them, you know, with their needs, like whatever, prayers, and and uh, um, sometimes we even do weddings, which is not very usual or traditional, but sometimes we have to because people come here, especially from Russia, and they don't belong to a parish yet, and so they come here, they, they like the monastery, and so we'll we'll do a wedding for them, you know, in a chapel, not in the main church. Um, so, whereas a parish priest is... Uh, now, some priest monks are given the com obedience. There again, it's obedience to be a missionary. Like St. Herman was a priest monk. He wasn't even a priest. He was a monk. And he was given the obedience to go to uh, Alaska and be a missionary. And so, especially the Russian church has always had... Uh, priests, monks, and monks that are missionaries. Even in Russia itself, just the monasteries were missionary centers. They populated Russia, actually. Northern Russia was settled by monasteries. They attracted people, and that's how all these towns got started. Um, whereas a, a parish priest is basically, he's in the world, he's among the people, and uh, of course today there's special <laughs> things because uh, uh, we live in a non-Orthodox culture, so a parish priest has to be very uh, good at uh, uh, trying to keep the people he's entrusted to be Orthodox and also to be a missionary to other people. So you might say it's a little bit more active outside in the world. And so for that reason, the priests usually in parishes are married um, as to help them cope with living in the world. Whereas a priest monk, you know, he's just doing his obedience. But naturally, he puts some, he might have some talents more than some other priest monk, and so he uses them. You know, always, though, in obedience, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, you're a monk, you know, and you, you don't have your own will. So, everybody has to do look for the will of God in their life. And if you're doing the will of God, God will help you do it. Um, to be a Christian, it might be considered difficult, especially these days. So I, I think of a monk as just a more concentrated Christian. He's a, he really he make he makes an oath to live the Christian ideals more intensely, perhaps more concentrated. You know, for that reason, he lives in a monastery, so he doesn't live in the world. You know, he doesn't have a family. To, and all like that. Not that that's not a good thing to have a family. It depends on the will of God. So if you're doing the will of God, that's most of the struggle. And God will help you do whatever you have to do. Well, I think when I was ordained um, uh, a priest, I have to say that was the most important day in my monastic life. <laughs> yeah. After my tonsure. I was ordained a higher deacon, but um, and that was important, but the priest is even more important, I think, because you actually do the liturgy, you serve the liturgy. I can't think of anything more important than that. Uh, 
um, as long as there are people searching for the truth, and there are people, um, you know, here, living here all the time, um, we get letters from people, emails, who are searching. And every day I get emails from people who want to know, because I, I take care of the commemorations here. So people write to me. I just got an email yesterday, I think it was. This man lives in the South, uh, some state in the South, and he was raised Baptist. And uh, he he's interested in Orthodoxy. He wants to be Orthodox, but his wife is not, she doesn't like anything outside of the Protestant. She doesn't, she just thinks probably he's nuts. So he's dealing with that, you know. But he's interested, and I wrote back to him, and I said, "Well, I like you, what well, you were, you know, but uh, just just keep it, you know, that it's important, you know, just don't let your family to take you away from the truth, you know." And he wrote back, and you know, he was so happy and everything. <laughs> so I imagine we will be in correspondence for a while, you know, hopefully the, and I think, you know, uh, and there are many people like that. America is a. People don't realize, I think in Russia, they think Americans are all cowboys or, you know, gangsters or rock musicians and movie stars. Those people exist, of course, but most Americans are just regular people. Um, we have a different culture than, than Russia in many ways. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, Americans are still a very religious people compared to like in Europe, from what I understand. There, um, there's a lot of uh, mobility. Now, that, of course, that means we have a lot of different sects, you know, all different kinds of, you know. But it shows people are searching, you know, and uh, they're looking for the truth. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them just get stuck in all these different, you know, because we have a lot of different teachers and, and everything. And, uh, the Catholic Church is probably the largest single denomination of you. Know, but they they're in big turmoil because of modernism and all the other problems living in an American society. So there are a lot of Catholics who become Orthodox, a lot of Protestants. We we convert people here all the time, and we're just one monastery and parishes. And I, I've noticed um, a lot of young people are looking for something, especially because of what's been going on now with the pandemic and and all the woke culture, whatever you call it, you know, that the people, at least a lot of young people unsettled, you know. Not everybody is deluded, you know. There, there are a lot of honest people looking for something real, you know. And so, definitely, um, I think in every country there, there are people converting to orthodoxy. I mean, I, I know, I lived in Bolivia for a year. And Bolivia is a very isolated country with a lot of Indians, a lot of old Indian culture. But I remember a couple of years ago, I was amazed. These a couple of Indian women went to Moscow and were baptized in Moscow, the Orthodox Church. And I thought, wow, talk about you know the will of God. You know, I mean, that's, I don't know how they they got interested somehow. A lot of Russian people come to me. They have a lot of problems with immigration, you know, moving to a, a lot of, especially women, looking for a better life, maybe looking for a good husband, <laughs> you know, and they have the impression, oh, they come to America, they'll find some good, solid, serious men who have good jobs. Well, if they're lucky, <laughs> they might find somebody like that. But uh, they're, they become very disappointed quite often, I think because this is not, uh, not everybody in America is rich. You know, not everybody is, um, there's a lot of difficulties. And I think they also miss their culture quite often. I know a lot of Russians never went to church in Russia, but when they come to America, they start going to church because I think they miss what they didn't really take advantage of in Russia. And of course the church reminds them of Russia. So that's a whole different set of, you know, but I, I think the you know the church is serving a purpose of helping a lot of Russians appreciate their faith and look, become you know I hear all the time people that never went to confession never went to communion 
And now they they come to me like the first time for confession. I thought, oh my God, you know. And they're like in their 40s or 50s or older. So it, it's kind of difficult, mm -hmm. you know, to help. Because we don't, there's only a few of us here. You know, and, uh, and we get lots of pilgrims like that. The Americans, it's a uh, whole different problems, you know. It's just learning to uh, free themselves from their preconceptions, you know. Um, about a lot of things and uh, nobody really likes to do that but you have to kind of you have to really realize that um, I, I mean I, I come from you know 10th generation or more American but I come to realize you know that America is just one little spot in the history of mankind <laughs> and, and uh, um, I mean I have relatives who still believe that America is very special God chosen, you know, democracy, we have to preach to the world, that whole thing. And that long ago I discarded. <laughs> I hope my relatives don't listen to this, but anyway, <laughs> but uh, I honestly don't believe that. And uh, so, uh, but you know, people of good faith, no matter what background they are, um, I've seen here how we have people, the monks among the brotherhood of different backgrounds. and. Basically, we all get together, or get along together, and uh, um, in parishes too. Um, it's I, from what I have seen, the Russian immigrants that uh, get along very well with the older immigrants and with American converts, and yes, because they're all united by their love of the faith, you know. And what's good now is I think. Today, of course, there's a lot of people who are nominally Orthodox, and, you know, but the people that go to church and everything, they're pretty much, uh, they're, they're earnest about, you know, their faith. And we all have weaknesses and strengths, and sometimes people fall away for a little while just because certain problems happen, you know. But basically, um, I think our, our, our little Russian church abroad, for example, it attracts people from all jurisdictions because we have our bishops are very traditional you know they uphold the ideals of Russia Holy Russia you know and um, so and that attracts a lot of people today because like in the Greek church there's a lot of turmoil because their bishops are trained very differently than ours and they're very much into the ecumenical movement and and uh, you know, I, I don't want to be too judgmental, but mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the people that are really looking for spirituality, um, they find in our church that it's it's held up on a pedestal. You know, it's not a pedestal, but it's lived. You know, so um, I I think there's a when I say a great for future, I don't mean you know that we're going to be building beautiful churches, but what we have been doing. Um, how long that'll continue, we don't know, but, and, you know, and, and um, but, but there will be people, always be people attracted to orthodoxy until the end of the world. True Christians have always felt they lived in the last days. If you read what people wrote in the first and second centuries, they thought it was the last days because the persecution was horrible from the Roman Empire of Christians. And uh, so they were, they, you know, they said, come, O oh Lord, come. You know, they, they really were hoping Christ would come right away because they didn't know if they could stand the persecution. And some couldn't, some fell away. Um, so, but now we know that, you know, those weren't the last days. Um, and so, but there's never been a time in the history of the church where somewhere the church wasn't persecuted. Even some places the church had no persecution you say, like, perhaps in medieval Russia, you know, although there you had the problems from the Mongols, the Tartars, and you had the problems from the Poles who were attacking, you know, Russia and everything. Um, but basically, um, the government supported the church, you know, orthodoxy, up until Russia, until communism took over. Well, that was, you could understand why people really thought the end of the world was coming then, because, I mean, I, you probably know better than I do. How can you imagine... You know, in a country where orthodoxy was the official religion, where all the, you know, the government functions always had priests and bishops and blessings and everything, and all of a sudden it just, you know, 
went off the map, you know, and that it must have seemed like the end of the world. But here we are still later, you know. So Christ said, you know, as a man, he, he didn't know when the end would come. And, uh, and uh, I think it's good for Christians to always feel the end is near. It makes them more pure, makes them more concentrated on what's essential, you know. We should never feel, oh, life is great, you know, it's easy, wow, you know, let's just enjoy it. You know? <laughs> because there's a temptation like that. You know, I I remember there were times in the past I'd get upset if if our choir wasn't so good, if some of the, choir, the better singers were visiting someplace. And I said to Father Luke, I saw, you know, he said, well, do you really think it's, we don't get grace from heaven if we have bad singing? <laughs> and I said, well, I would probably not, you know. And that's why we have to concentrate. And he says, what do you think in Richmond, Maine? Do you think they're having the same grace that we're having here when they have like three old women singing? That's all, you know? And, uh, or some little mission, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I visited in Argentina some parishes where they, they, they do, they just have a few old people singing, you know? And somehow it's, people still want to go to church there and want to get the Holy Communion and so. <laughs> And, uh, да, начале было трудно, но потому что русский язык трудный язык для американцев. Но я всегда любил учиться языкам. Но, к сожалению, не учился русскому языку, пока я не переехал сюда. Я учился испанскому и много лет, но это, может быть, помогало мне тем, что я э, знал, ну, как грамматикой заниматься, но. А, но я приехал сюда, и, конечно, как в то время большинство наставников говорили по-русски, я быстро учился, в крайней мере, вериться правильно людям, что они понимали, что я хотел сказать. Но ошибаюсь, конечно, грамматика русская очень трудная для американцев. Но, а, но я, я понял, что а, когда я начал, начал говорить по-русски, все братья старшие, они, обили, они были так довольны со мной, что я хоть попробовал говорить, потому что они очень оценили это. Да? Так что... И поэтому они всегда говорят, о, вы так хорошо говорите, брат Филипп. Так хорошо, я знал, что они так хорошо говорят. Но <laughs> они просто не, не были привыкли к тому, что американцы говорят, говорят по-русски. Так что... а, я, я американец, естественно, и родился здесь. Передки все американцы на много веков. А, но чем-то я тоже чувствую как русский, потому что я, ну, что немножко иронично и смешно, что сейчас я, я для многих являюсь как пример русского монаха из, из, между старшими, ну? потому что после воды я старший здесь иеромонах, как и Мадрид. А, не по возрасту, у нас есть монах, который старше меня, но по почину, да? И я всегда борюсь, э, ну, мило, конечно, не, не, не агрессивно, что держать русский язык, э, славянский язык на службах, потому что у нас, конечно, много американцев, большинство семеристов американцы сейчас, и э, хотя они должны учиться русскому языку, ну, все говорят по-русски, по-английски, а служба много английского языка сейчас, хотя зависит, если это праздник или будний день, а, но Владыка назначил меня в, в вот, комитет, который занимается, как, а, какие способы принимать, что сохранить русскость монастыря и русский язык. Но это немножко смешно, 
смешно для меня, но интересно. Um, и я тоже эконом, значит, я, я занимаюсь кухней. И я всегда стараюсь, потому что у нас была русская еда, как mm -hmm. можно почаще, да, для того, чтобы сохранить эту культуру. Um, русская культура напитана православием. И я тоже стал, как, эм, не знаю, как по-русски, эм, даже по-английски, э, вот такой старик, который рассказывает сказки <laughs> со временем. И даже не думаю, но мне говорят что-то, я думаю, а, да, у нас, когда я приехал, я всегда говорю, когда я приехал, так и так было, так было. И потому что э, я думаю, что это очень... Э, Интересный учительный, да, молодик сценаристов тоже. Я жалею иногда, что я не заранее вот, привел порядок в моей жизни. <laughs> И что многое, что я с опозданием, все делаю с опозданием. Но пока я живой, может быть, я успеваю сделать, что нужно делать. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. Okay. I'll send you the bill. <laughs>